Hi, I'm Cliff Clegg. Um, and I have been around the block a few times. Um, I've uh, uh, been part of a number of startups in the last 15 years. Uh, I wrote my first compiler when I was 15. I did the core guts of the Hotspot JIT and then went on to do all sorts of other guts inside of Hotspot at uh, Azul. And uh, I don't know, I, I, lots of fun experience here. So I've been in startups for more than 15 years now. Um, three main ones and then sort of helping with lots of little startups at different times. Uh, the big ones were Azul Systems, where we built custom hardware for running Java, so supercomputers to run Java. Um, the big chips had 850 plus cores, read and write barriers for garbage collection, transactional memory, hardware, um, very, very low latency GCs. Uh, these days, an Azul collector will give you max GC pause times in the low microsecond range, uh, independent of heap size. So this is on terabyte sized heaps and you know, 50, 100 gigs a second allocation rates in the low microsecond pause time. So that's kind of out there. Uh, H2O, big data machine learning workloads. So parallel and distributed tooling for doing things with big data and machine learning. Um, a, a, a very fast, uh, exact, consistent key value store. I'll talk more about that. A bunch of bleeding edge ML algorithms. The first. Um, First distributed uh, uh, GBM, gradient boosting machine, um, easily the fastest generalized linear modeling and so on and so forth. Norensic was looking for fraud in the stock market, for which I was sort of shockingly successful at finding fraud. Um, you would like to think your markets are uh, uh, safe and consistent and well, uh, well policed, and the truth is way worse than that by, by a long shot. Um, and that's a different story, but it's, it's another exciting thing. So um, this is about you know, what goes on in these startups and the kind of life experiences. So while I'm going through here, um, and by the way, these slides, I, I wrote all of them this morning. So yesterday there was nothing. So if you find typos or giant missing holes in what you want to know, like, like stop me and ask questions. So I don't have a chess timer talk, but eh, I'm good with that. It's, it's a better model than me just lecturing for two hours. Um, so why do I do startups? Um, because you get to tackle real problems. Because you can fix what's broken. Because you don't get told what to go fix. You have to stare and figure out what to go fix. And then you get to go do it. right? And, and you don't have time to micromanage people or to be micromanaged in return. You hire good people, and you cut them loose, and you let them go solve the problem. right? You, you make sure they're pointing in the right direction, and you let them go. Um, what you do or don't do makes a big difference. So this is not I'm squirreling away in a corner in some big faceless organization pounding on some minor problem. Um, whatever you're doing, whether it's good or bad, makes a difference, good or bad. So you can screw around and diddle and have fun and play games, and your money will disappear, and your startup goes down the toilet. And that happened to me. So, right, so, so the good and bad goes both directions. And there's a lottery ticket you know, sort of mentality payoff that you kind of hope for. Um, I did all right in one of these startups and walked away with enough money that I'm not looking hard for work right now. I'm sort of in a big sabbatical. Um, but it's not, it should not be your real goal, your primary reason for being in a startup. It should be like, yeah, that'd be nice if that happens. Um, the other side, of course, is, uh, you know, being your own boss means that you have to figure out what's important and what's not. And then you have to work on what's important and not on what's fun. And so sometimes those two overlap and that's great and you're having a great time solving hard problems and also doing what needs to be done. And sometimes you're doing grunt work that you really don't like to do, but somebody has to do it, and there ain't no other somebody but you, right? Um, finances, I had some wild and crazy roller coaster rides. I had, you know, missing paychecks, uh, dropped insurance one week before my son had a grand mal epileptic seizure. Um, I was out six months paying hospital bills on that one, getting that sorted out. Uh, CD characters of various kinds, including things that were very, uh, very obviously very criminal, but very hard to prosecute, for which you know one of the startups went down the toilet because this guy walked off with most of the money. So, so you know, cops have a job for a reason still. So let me go work through the different startups, and, and like I said, stop me if you have a question or if you want to know what the hell happened, um, or I'll get to the end. I'll run out of time, and we won't necessarily have time to answer all your questions. But you know. I don't know. So I was at Sun for many years. 
Um, but sun management was basically fucked up. Um, yeah, it was fucked up. That was the right word. Um, and so I was unable to make progress on the Java virtual machine. There was lots of stuff I wanted to do, couldn't get it done because of management, not because of technical reasons. So a lot of interesting stuff left on the plate, like tail call elimination was totally like, I knew how the hell to do it, and I was ready to go do it, and sun management wouldn't let me do it, right? So, so, so I'll, I'll paint the blame right there. Um, I hit a point in my life where I was doing other things to entertain myself than write code, and I otherwise would love to code. I had a car where I was tracking it, and I uh, had the brakes fail at 110 miles an hour on Thunder Hill Raceway, and I wadded the car up. And a week later, Azul Systems called me up and said, hey, we're building custom hardware for Java. And I took a look, you know, big philosophical look at my life, like, what the hell am I doing? I was still, you know, badly bruised up from that accident, and I said, I'm out of here. And I walked over to Azul, and I came in as employee number 12, and started turning Azul around to being a mixed hardware software company from basically a pure hardware company. So a bunch of hardware guys doing Java jitting with this 3DFX graphics card mentality. We're gonna make these cheap CPUs and bazillions of them, and they're each gonna run Java, and we're gonna run big multi-threaded server apps. That was the, the basic thing. They had a lot of weird interpreter-only ops for interpreting Java, and I was like, no, don't you dare interpret Java, JIT it. And that means make a good jitting target. So make a nice, clean JIT target. A uh, bunch of special caches for making virtual calls fast, bunch of special caches for doing method lookups for all, all kinds of weird stuff. I said, eh, blow all that out. Better JIT target, 32 register, 64 bit, simple three address risk. Super easy JIT target, had a lot of cool stuff in there from my uh, long time compiler days that makes it a very good target for making code for, and 24 cores per die in 2004. Along the way then, I had a chance to go rewrite huge chunks of Hotspot. So I'd just come from Sun, been working on Hotspot, had this giant list of to-dos of things I wanted to clean up that I couldn't do at Sun, uh, and I just went hog wild. Uh, I rewrote all the threading stuff, I rewrote all the exception handling stuff, I did much of the core runtime, like over, redid, um, giant push over three months, um, there was like 20,000 lines deleted, 5,000 added, 5,000 changed in that 30,000 line diff there. Um, as a consequence, um, Azul Systems can checkpoint single threads in nanoseconds. It's like really fast. And that means that that's part of the low latency GC story. There's a lot of things you want to do with individual threads that you need to stop and ask questions about them. Hey, Jan, come in, because you're going to show up on a slide or two. Thought I'd just give you fair warning. <laughs> um, I integrated the C1 and C2 compilers, which up to that time were um, uh, never running in the same VM at the same time because there was part of the screw up at Sun Management was the, the compiler teams weren't integrating well and no one was making that happen. Uh, read barriers and write barriers for garbage collection, uh, hugely faster blocking and blocking threads came in as part of that consequence. Um, so faster start and stop. Uh, single word object headers, cut down on footprint and your caches, right? Uh, just hugely less code and complexity. Great fun hack, all locked behind the Azul paywall. Um, along the way, I wrote this really fast, uh, I say I wrote, but, but the Azul team wrote this really fast hardware simulator, uh, running on the you know, best of breed x86 at the time. We were getting about uh, 20 megahertz equivalent of an Azul hardware under simulation on an x86. So definitely fast enough to boot the OS and run you know, modest Java programs. We got past Java Hello World up to some of the earlier spec benchmark numbers, all under simulation. Um, and along the way, we were finding all kinds of Java virtual machine bugs because we were targeting a very weak memory model that we were going to bring up to the JMM spec by adding the right kind of fences. But everyone else on the planet had been using either Spark TSO or x86 hardware models where the x86 wouldn't tell you what their memory model was. They didn't actually know. But it was very conservative, right? So the actual Java memory model allows for a lot more uh, uh, memory interleavings than are actually appearing on x86, but would appear on an Azul box, and we're appearing on Itanium. So I had been doing the Itanium port at Sun, got it up to some good state, and walked away from it. Uh, in terms of like the JIT was working, but the runtime system was still failing on Itanium. So Steve Goldman and I were going back and forth and finding data race bugs for very, uh, uh, very weak memory model hardwares in the VM itself, right? Um, 
as part of that simulator, I ended up coming up with the best data race detector tool I've ever used. Um, and I looked at lots of them over time. And that's a different talk, but I can tell you how the hell the damn thing works. But uh, this is like a really slick tool. We did a bunch of cacheware profiling. Um, we were targeting hardware with lots more cores and lots less cache than an x86 and a lot lower cache associativity. And so you have all kind of weird cache conflicts. And what the hell is in your cache? If you want to know what modern CPU performance is about, it's about what's in your cache. Well, what is in your cache? OK, you, there's no cache profilers out there. Under simulation, though, I can give you what's in your hell is your cache and let you, you know, rejigger re your program to fit things in cache better. Um, we got chips back after about two years. The first chips came back. We were all hugely excited. The hardware guys were up like 24 hours in advance, like waiting for the they could slice and dice and then put them in epoxy and get them. OK, fine. Put the juice on, turn them on, and the L2s are like completely wedged. There's some kind of weird bug. It's wiped out almost all the L2s. So on a core that would have 24 dies with three large L2s, um, most of it were dead. So we found we could turn off the four associativity on the L2s, and maybe one core would be able to use the, what remains of the L2. And so you could get a couple cores running on a die. Um, we had branch predictor bits bleeding into the register, uh, register selection path. So you have a branch instruction, and it jumps left or right. If you have a, another instruction there that was using registers, the, the standard decode logic would decode the branch predictor in the same way as it's doing registers at the same time as part of the instruction decode path. Those happen in parallel, right? Well, it turns out because of the bleed over, if your branch target, if your instruction as interpreted as a branch had a target that was an odd address it, with the register number you were getting, if the instruction was going to be interpreted as a register-based instruction instead of a branch. So you had to branch to even addresses and only use even registers to make this work. Um, we could fix that in the JIT. Great. The chip still had to be over-voltaged to have it go at all. Not over-clocked, over-voltaged, which meant that it burned power. It got too hot. So there was literally a die sitting here, and there was a huge cooling fan blowing on it like 24-7, and the thing was still running like far too hot. And also, if you run too high a voltage, you have a thing called electron migration, which is a software guy I hadn't actually heard of until then. But as, the, as your silicon has too much voltage, you have the P and P, the doping atoms. The atoms actually get too much uh, magnetic fields crossing them, and they migrate within the silicon. So as the atoms migrate, the, 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 the P's and the N pieces go the wrong way. Eventually, it shorts out, and your chip basically melts internally slowly, but with this weird process of pushing atoms through the silicon matrix. So we eventually got a second rev of the chip back with these bugs fixed. Uh, a late security bug was discovered by a junior engineer um, in the register window handling. So eventually we got a third rev. But by this point, the chips are very stable. That is to say, they have good yield. We, we, everything's running correctly. Um, minimal system is two, two uh, sockets, so it would be 48 cores, but 384 in a 16-core box, about the size of a dorm room fridge. Um, at that size, was, was at that era was unheard of. So each core is much slower than x86, but the stack of them is you know, equivalent to 40. Um, this was, you know, like I said, unheard of amount of performance in a, in a Java box. We also had bandwidth that was up in the top 10 supercomputers um, at that era. So it was like a huge amount of bandwidth as well. As it, you know, as it was sort of put together, you know, a bunch of things really worked out well. So huge core count means things like uh, a huge amount of parallelism, so I can run the entire TCK in like 20 minutes. So this is like 100,000 tests, um, which typically Sun would take over an eight hour period, um, or on a big farm would be several hours. I can do about 20 minutes uh, all in one process. So it's like a hugely faster. Uh, parallel, concurrent, incremental GC. Um, at that time, we weren't down to the microsecond range, but it was in the low millisecond range pretty quick. Um, on, on half a terabyte of heap, and again, at that era, that was unheard of. You could not get x86 hardware at that size heap, but if you did, the GC pause times would be in the tens of minutes. So, right, so it's like un unbelievably huge. Um, there were companies who ran the very largest heaps doing like high frequency trading, and they would just simply not allow a full GC cycle to happen during the eight hour workday. At the end of the day, instead of having a full GC cycle happen, you would simply kill the process and start again. 
you're laughing, but, but this is what it was, right? It's like, holy shit, okay. Um, so this setup worked out really well on a certain set of class of apps, including web app portals. So for instance, uh, Kohl's bought it for running Black Thursday, whatever, the, the giant shopping day of the year, where all their prior systems would just go down under load. And this box would start at about 10% load and hit about 40% load at the max peak trading hour. And they figured that they were making some number of millions of dollars per hour on Black Friday. Um, and over the course of the weekend, they would earn like $20 million for not having crashed over what they got when they ran with a Sun hardware setup and had it crash, um, which totally paid for the box in one weekend, right? So, so it was like fabulous success, success story. Um, we had a bunch of people who fell in that category. Um, bunch of hardware stuff sort of all worked as expected. Lower cost virtual calls for the hardware support for array reference lookups of the range checks and the, the lookup. Uh, bunch of fun stuff going well. Hardware transactional memory that chip had support for hardware transactional memory where the use of all of the L1 cache was reserved, could be reserved for a transaction. Um, basically put on transactional mode, he started tracking your L1 cache lines. If you never lost an L1 cache line during the course of the transaction, then no one else has seen what you've done to your L1, that line in your L1. And then when you came to commit the transaction, you simply flipped all the bits at once saying it's done. Right, so the transaction could as, get as big as the L1. Um, it, it worked great in theory. In practice, of course, it completely failed. And it failed for a stupid reason, which is there are junk true dependencies in the standard JDK code. People don't write transaction-friendly code by default. So to make this work, I'd have to be able to diagnose and profile your standard Java locking idioms and say, if you do this a little differently, then we could transact through your locks and you would still have standard Java locking, but the hardware transactional memory would let the locks run concurrently. Um, the poster child for this, by the way, is a very obvious one, is simply take a concurrent hash table. Using caches everywhere, right? You're caching something. You have a rare writer who's updating the cache. You have lots of readers who are hitting in cache successfully, but because you have a rare writer, you have to lock the cache. And because of that, the readers are all get locked and single threaded. So the obvious thing to do is say, the reader should transact through, and the occasional writer actually blocks the cache. And in practice, it didn't actually work because of a mod count that every transaction went through. Every reader or writer would bump a plus one on I've been to this cache, and the plus one was a true data dependency across all your readers, and that blew out your hardware transaction memory, which you could fix by fixing hash table and hash map and every single piece of JDK code that had this kind of pattern and everyone who depended on it, and it just wasn't worth it. Um, and then there were lots of just bad Java code. Um, uh, uh, you know, three, three letter acronym companies with large important web servers were crashing because they had code that was just not following the job spec. Um, and it didn't, correct, didn't crash very often on an x86, but it was possible, it was just rare. Um, but for us, it would crash like reliably every time. And that was a, you know, lesson learned between the industry and, and Azul systems on what was allowed and what wasn't. Um, but the true killer was that the cores were too slow. And, you know, we could crank up the parallel knob a lot in a lot of different directions. A lot of cores for doing background GC, if you're running the JIT in the background, all the IO is done by hot spinning cores are just looking at, you know, the IO latency was very good, very low. But the actual performance problem was the, the chips were one tenth in x86 and people's <coughs> mental model of how they write code was you had a few fast processors not lots of slow ones. And so it just didn't work. It didn't fit enough different kinds of application models to be worthwhile. The second generation chips came in with a faster clock and two-way issue and it hit under missed cache and bigger caches and about a quarter in x86 speed now, better, but not a good enough, not enough. Third generation chips came back with twice as many cores and twice as big as caches, but, but still about the same, you know, like 20% faster, not enough. So the ultimate result was we're all sort of addicted to fast, single-threaded performance, and we're only eating the parallel pill because we have to. Uh, and now, you know, life. Life goes on. So, you know, Azul was a good employer. I have no complaints about that. Um, I didn't win the lottery, but I had the greatest time of my life working on that shit. 
the hardware, the hacks on the Java VM, it was all great fun. Um, somewhere in there, I went through a really ugly divorce. And I'm not going to blame us all, although I'll, I mention it here because startups can and do cause divorce. And if you live in the valley, this is sort of a background known thing that uh, uh, the amount of stress and time and energy puts a really high load on all your relationships. Um, mine was in the cards from a decade ago. You know, in hindsight, looking back, I can tell you when and where and why things started to fall apart. Um, Azul was a, was a, a symptom, not a cause. Um, ultimately, I moved on in both senses. So I'm coming out of the divorce. Steve Jobs died. Uh, I'm chatting with a friend. It's a very philosophical moment. Like, what the hell am I doing in my life? You know, a decade ago, it was racing cars and having 100 mile an hour failure into a you know, concrete barrier at 100 miles an hour, you know, 60 miles an hour when I hit the barrier. Um, this time it was just like, you know, here's this guy who is just synonymous with change and, and making, you know, putting people first and having done something right and standing up for what he believed in and making a difference. And what am I doing with my life? So change, new startup time. So redundant array of inexpensive nodes was the basic concept. Uh, a better key value store using like raid like concepts. Um, hardware coherency and now a pretty strong notion of how hardware uh, cache coherency protocols work. So I can step you through in great detail about how they work and why. Um, I could do that in software. I could do it on a large cluster. Maybe I can make a better key value store. Lots of fun with water puns. OK. So we started building this distributed key value store in Java. Um, I had like my, my desktop, my laptop, and my kid's machine. And I'm trying to run this three-way setup in my house and debugging Paxos and multicast and IO buffers and all kinds of stuff. And I get to a point where I can add in sort of kill nodes. When I kill nodes, I mean, I don't mean shut them down. I mean, like, like pull the plug, like bam, with a kill minus nine, right? Rapid replication of data means that you can bring somebody up and it rapidly you get, you get full copies as needed. Um, exist, uh, consistent, exact, fast, it was like all of it, right? If you have a true large network split, I'm going to give up a little bit of availability, but typically for drop nodes, nothing, right? So, so if you had a 100 node cluster and you were going to shoot nodes down and bring them up, there would be no loss anywhere and it would be fast and consistent and exact. So, so I, this is in the H2O right now, and so I can step people through how that works at some point. I'm not going to have time in this talk, but it's out there uh, in the open source. Proudly walked into Apple with this fantastic key value store, set up a five node cluster by literally opening the lids on five Linux laptops, grabbing the Apple guest Wi-Fi, the cluster auto finds itself and builds a five node cluster in seconds, and Apple yawns, like, yeah, whatever. Um, you know, KV store market is heavily saturated. We clearly have a better answer. It's much faster. It's much more reliable. It has all this exact and consistent properties. You can drop nodes. Just you know, you can come and go. Whatever hell, not good enough. So we 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 burned. Oh my gosh, almost a year, nine months, trying to head the wrong direction. So we tried again. Went to American Express. Same yawn. And then they mentioned, hey, you guys know anything about this new machine learning stuff? Um, uh, sure, we know something. OK. Rush to Starbucks. I spent three hours coding parallel distributed high school least squares best fit line. But it was parallel and distributed. I ran back to AMX and said, hey, look at this. And they were like, oh, that's pretty cool. You got something there. Got anything else? No. OK, and, and da, 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 da. it's going to not fail. OK, good. It is going to fail. It's not going to fail. Pivot. OK, key startup idea, notion. Everything you've done so far was interesting and useful, and you did the best you could with what you knew at the time, and you were in the wrong thing. Time to change directions. So don't give up, and don't cry, and don't have a, you know, a, a whiny, whiny session, except maybe one afternoon. And hey, let's go talk about, you know, um, big data and machine learning. So immediately rush over and like, okay, what the hell? The first thing you have to do is you have to have ETL that's like really solid. And that is the first experience for any machine learning tool is get the data into the tool. So ETL is crucial. So we burned a lot of cycles getting a really fast, really good parallel uh, distributed scale out CSV parser. 
So I'll claim the H2O CSV parts are still one of the best in the breeds. 99% chance that they'll take anything that looks vaguely CSV-like that you have that's in the, yeah, you know, megabytes to terabyte range and eat it in one pass and do the right thing from right out the door. We get basic algorithms in there. We start on upgrading to like, you know, generalized linear regression. We hire Jan for a year or so. Um, he's saying, we should do random forest. And we're like, what the hell is random forest? Okay, it's the new hotness in ML. So we're talking, you know, five years ago. Huge debates over paralyzing RF, right? Random forest. How to paralyze big data in any case. What's the right way to lay the data out, columnar and, and, and row-wise and block chains and whatever the hell. We go through a bunch of iterations. We come up with a random force. We go to Amex, again, American Express, and we lose to SkyTree. This is a, a single node solution that's been around the block a while. And we look hard at why we lost. And we lost because you weren't yet serious with the math. Here is a shop of guys who are systems programmers doing parallel and shared coding. And they read an RF paper. And you did a great presentation. A great discussion, but we were not yet serious with the math. And that was the hard lesson there, that you have to get the math right, really right. So we, we basically pivoted at that point again to becoming a, a math machine learning shop. So we hired mathematicians. So I, I won't claim you're a mathematician, but you know this stuff really well. We hired real mathematicians, real data scientists, and discovered that there were some important things that we were not doing right. And there was a lot of these little, little funny edge cases that you think you kind of like, eh, loosey-goosey, blah, blah, blah. No, they're, they're done a specific way for a specific reason. You have lots of fussy bits to get right. And as we got the right, we, our algorithm started getting better and better and better. Um, we redo the core data parallel infrastructure again. So uh, now it becomes this column compressed store, and we're using this, this key value store. It actually works out really well as a convenient coding paradigm for systems level coding of big data infrastructure. The column compression gets us about 2x better size than gzip on disk. So we can load a, a gzip CSV file, and it's actually less space in RAM than it is on disk. And we can do parallel math. And we can do parallel math at the full compressed memory bandwidth speeds, because we only decompress it in the registers, never in even your caches. It's never decompressed in memory, never decompressed in your caches, literally decompressed in registers only. Um, and this lets us run really fast compared to all sorts of competitors out there. Um, first parallel and distributed gradient boosting machine. There are lots of people saying you cannot parallelize this algorithm, and I showed people how to do it. And that was a lot of fun. We got our GLM ever increasingly improved until the last thing we took some Comcast data set with seven terabytes of network intrusion data and ran a generalized linear modeling on it in like 90 seconds. It was like a couple minutes to load. And once it was in RAM, the actual GLM was like 90 seconds. And we started looking at things like running R and Python for machine learning on big data by having the R Python ship expression math as lispy expressions in URLs to a web server that was in H2O that would then run the data on the, the H2O cluster, where it would have the space to handle a terabyte of data and do something with it. Um, and then there are a lot of, you know, just life goes on. So somewhere early on, um, we had our first team fire. And that's always a really painful experience. Here's a guy who gave up a stable, reliable job, and he sacrificed a lot of stuff, and you get him in, and you start working with him for a little while, and you realize it's not a good fit. And this is, uh, um, people who say it, it's, it's uh, uh, I don't know how to say it right here. It, it's fail fast, right? Um, don't, don't feel sorry for the, don't do more than feel sorry for the guy. Don't let him hang on. Don't try to make it fit. Square peg, round hole, it's not going to work. Stop now. So it's painful, but do it and get it over with. Um, we keep finding hires and discovering that, like we couldn't find a good rule on when to hire and when not. Like the standard techie hire situation, you hear in a lot of places you do this some sort of, uh, of, of quiz and the company where they send you, like go write me a bubble sort or something like that. Okay, that seems to be a really bad way to judge how well somebody's gonna work in a team coding environment over a long period of time. It's like really bad. So, so a much better rule is to hire for enthusiasm, not for experience. And for skill sets, we give people a week on a GitHub. Here is a more complicated algorithm than bubble sort. And you got no time limit. Tell us when you're ready for us to look at your answer. And if they're excited, they'll spend a day and do something cool. And if they're not excited, they'll never get back to you. And it works. 
I mean, it just, that, that, that's a great filter. Okay, and if they're excited, they'll learn, and they'll learn fast. So hire for enthusiasm, not experience. That was fun, right? So then we ended up renting this old ex-startup house, house has been running startups for a little while, from the 50s, next to a Taco Bell, so that's my $2, two minutes, get back to work. I didn't tell people to do that, that's just what happened to be. You, you, you're busy, you gotta get shit done, you're starving, you're two bucks, two minutes, back in the office. Um, I had a fun experience here. We have a data center in this 50s era house, which consisted of the back room, and a couple rocks, and a bunch of servers in the rock, and a bunch of fans, one in, one out, the bottom, the top of the room, and there was like a floor ceiling window, and so you just like open the window at the floor, like water would come in, except the fan is blowing out. Um, and, and you cool the room that way. It's great, and I'm running this large parallel map reduce as a paradigm for doing you know, big data codings. So just so people understand, you mostly wrote code that mostly looks like single-threaded Java code in a for loop, except the index on the for loop was it could be in the trillions. So you have i equals 1 to n, where n was some number that could be very, very large, and you had a 2D array, and you did your math, but you wrote like single-threaded, and it was auto-parallel, auto-distributed. So I'm running this now on a 10-node cluster, um, and each node has got like 32 cores, or 16, or whatever the number was there, whatever, power goes out. Oh, shit. So we go back in the server room, we flip the breakers, reboot everything, you know, test all the things. Oh, it's all good. I, I go set it up again, hit enter, power goes out again. Okay, once was like a freak. Twice when I hit enter, like literally enter, boom, room goes down. What the hell? Well, okay. I got x86 at idle, burns 100 watts. At full bore, it's burning 300 watts. I got 10 of them, I burn 3,000 watts. A power strip pops. Okay, wait, power strip? What the fuck? Sure enough, out of time, out of money, out of energy, out of everything else. The two racks we bought on discount had 10 servers racks in there, and they were chained with Ace hardware power strips. So the power strips popped. But it's not too hard to realize that if the power strips hadn't popped, we'd have just burned the house down. So, so it was good that they popped. Um, time to upgrade. So we went to upgrade the power in the building. And we had a guy go up there who was actually did the Spark uh, L1, Spark 123 version cache coherency protocols. He was the hardware guy that I learned my hardware coherency protocols from. He was stomping around the attic and he discovers a bare 240 volt line, like naked wires, 240 volts. You step on it, you're gonna like a fry, right? Um, and it bypasses the power meter. <laughs> so you don't have to build for power, which means that we're actually in a grow house. We're in an old 1950s grow house. It's got one big room, it's got lots and lots of white lights, it's like a big bullpen with good lighting for the programmer. It's a great room for programming. <laughs> or raising plants. So we talk to the owner quietly, say, hey, we have a problem. So the owner says, okay, I'll send my dude over. Well, his dude is a sort of a handyman kind of guy, and we want to re-plumb for 240 volts, which is a very specific thing you do for 240 volts that you have to get right. And he starts to screw up the job, and we tell him, hey, back off, we'll go hire an electrician who's official to do this right. He calls, the maintenance man calls pg &E. So pg &E gets rumor that there's an old grow house that has a bypass power line. They're responsible if the house were to burn down because they're supplying power to the house. It's not correctly wired up. So they rush over in like 15 minutes or less. They have a guy up a pole, and, and we, get, we do get the polite knock on the door. Hi, we're pg &E. We're here to cut your power. Uh, wait, uh, can we? No. Uh, please? Okay, five minutes to shut everything down politely, and boom, power's out. So I got 10 engineers and no power, and no chance of getting power because the house is not wired right, and pg &E is pissed as hell. So we haul off to Starbucks, and we like camp out at Starbucks for a week. Meanwhile, we go to the owner and like, dude, we're renting this place, and your house is not like safe for anything, much less you know a startup. So owner, who's let's say a, a low-income renter, not saying slumlord, um, has all kinds of cool things floating around. Oh, am I running out of time here? Oh shit! Oh my god! Uh, well, this is a fun story. I'll, I'll see how far we go here. So he brings in a large diesel generator he has lying around somewhere. I don't know. It's a, it's a full-size tow thing. I can't put my hands on it. It's a big-ass thing. He gets a cable like this out of the generator, goes through the front door, and into the house main. 
turns the generator on, the whole house has got power. So we are free from PG&E, but we're burning about $1,000 worth of diesel fuel a week. Uh, and it goes, bum, 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 the whole house, bum, 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 but it has power. Okay, fine. So now he's bringing in a mob of electricians to rewire the house, because he's, by the way, liable for, for having a grow house. So he's trying to not get like smacked around by the police or anything. So he hires a team of electricians to come in to rewire the house. They rewire the whole house in two weeks up to business standards from home standards. Um, I'm literally at my desk coding when there's like stuff falling in my hands. I'm like, what the hell? And I look up, and there's a hole in the ceiling and the guy's just finishing with saws all and the chunk falls down. Um, and he pokes his head and looks at me and ah, I'll just move my keyboard over here. Um, and you know, he, little plate in the ceiling and the wire comes down for wiring my desk and it's all great. Um, so we end up having a big functioning, you know, big data machine learning tool. I'll clean is vastly easier than Spark to set up and run, like vastly easier. Like, like on your desktop, it's like one shot, instant seconds. Uh, a cluster is two seconds. It's like really fast. And it's clearly faster to do analytics. And we have better algorithms. It's clearly best to breed, uh, um, bleeding edge state of the art. Um, but it's vastly harder to use than say R and Python and scikit-learn and that genre of tools. So, and we also have very fewer algorithms because we've targeted the primary winning algorithms, but there are, there's a large, there's a long tail distribution on math algorithms for doing machine learning, and we have not been able to target them all by any means. So we walk into Netflix to give a demo, and it, it crashes on startup. And the system's not robust enough, and there's a bunch of things about resource limitations, so if you put in more data than you have memory for, it will run out of memory and crash in a bad way. And there's you know, problems, basically, to, to selling an enterprise software. It's a long sales cycle. There's lots of point of contact sales where you don't eventually get a sale. We had lots of comments where, we'll buy you if you also do X. And that means that we have to do one X for every customer. But that's a consulting company. It's a different company, right? Everyone knows that machine learning is a new hotness. It will save them. Somewhere, you know, Netflix's uh, 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 money, the million dollar reward for having a better algo, like woke up the valley. Like, oh my God, we have all this data. Um, we don't know what to do with it, though. But we know that machine learning will save us somehow. We just don't know how. So we had to do a lot of hand-holding and consulting to help people understand how to do machine learning. And that's what they wanted. They didn't want a better tool. They wanted consulting work on doing machine learning. So it's actually very hard to get H2O going as a, as a company selling a platform. Building the platform was, I would say, fun, definitely, and relatively easy, but you know, a couple years of hard work, but a lot of fun, but actually selling the platform is much more difficult. Um, Teams keep, keeps growing, and, and you know, we move to a nicer, larger office space, and I keep having more and more conflicts with my co-founder, and I basically don't like how he treats people. Um, I spend a lot more of my time, I'll say, rescuing good people from, you know, tears where the, the co-founder has chewed them out for no good reason. Um, stupid shit. And I'm not making product, I'm making, keep people happy. And I'm, he's hiding finances from me, and I'm not, he's not willing to take my help or not able to take it, I don't know what. And I want to be in, in for real, not just a VP of engineering or a CTO. I want to actually have, you know, a, a material piece of the company, right? So eventually, you know, it, it doesn't work. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not happy there. Life's too short to be unhappy at what you do all your life or where you're at, right? And, and eventually, I hit a breaking point and I walk. So that was a couple years ago. I'm now officially over time. So whatever people want, I'll keep going until I get shut down by somebody. OK, so another startup. Um, I will say that you, it's crucial to recharge between goes, get your senses back, get a weird connection through my Burning Man stuff. Crazy guy from Chicago, David W. He's doing machine learning on stock data. He's finding fraud. He's actually writing, a writer of trading algorithms. He's trying to defend himself from other people committing fraud against his trading algorithms. Um, and he has a demo, and he's actually shown it to the CFTC, and he's catching people that they're trying to catch. And so they're like really excited about this thing too. And I've been curious about fintech markets, so maybe it's time to play. So I show up, there's a team of about 15 engineers who have been working on uh, uh, the product version for about a year and a half. Stuff's not coming together. They have all kind of funny issues. Their CTO is David's good buddy, who's a great guy and a nice programmer, but he's no VP of engineering. He's no CTO, right? He's a good hacker. He's a right startup combo, smart business guy, smart hacker guy, but when you hit like 20 people, it's time to rotate 
roles, people and roles to fit, right? So I'll figure I'll sort out the Chicago team, add some serious, you know, continuous integration, lots of more testing, get some product design simplification. There's like a database and like five random languages in use, and it's no product yet. Like, what the hell's going on? Um, I show up there and look, and there's no technical leadership at all. Um, the Chicago team is totally dysfunctional. There's no direction either. They're using F sharp, Clojure, Diatomic, C sharp, C++, um, some amount of Java, and something else. It's like crazy all over the map, Python. Lots of lone wolf hotshot types who all are independently knowing that they're in charge of their piece, but they're not talking to each other in any way. So there's no integration and no plan to integrate either, other than everyone knows, somebody else knows what the integration plan is, but no one actually knows what the integration plan is. They all just think somebody else, right? So I show up and I say, okay, basically we have to make this work, guys. The party's over, like F sharp, like really guys? What the fuck, right? So, <laughs> sorry, this is the wrong crowd for that, but it's the right crowd. You have to hear it, right? You gotta make shit work, you gotta make shit work. So F sharp would work, by the way, if everyone in the room was doing it and it was sensible for the project at hand. I'm looking at data sets that are gonna be in the high gigs to low terabyte range. I'm not gonna shove them through F sharp at, a, at a, enough speed to, to actually work. So most of these guys end up leaving in a few months. Um, I didn't want to fire them. There were a few fires that were obvious and happened pretty quick. And then there were some people who just like, they, they bled off. I end up hiring four good guys from Silicon Valley. We start from scratch, six months later, working. Like fast, simple, easy, and actually, actually working. Product is fast and accurate. 5% false positive rate down from 95% on the comp competitor. The best competitors out there have this huge false positive rate. And so most of the compliance officer's time is simply sorting out false positives. We reverse that number, it's hugely better. And again, you know, the learnings from H2 about getting that first time user experience right, oh, we totally nailed it up. There's a jar, you, you copy the jar to your disk, you say Java dash Norensic, bam, pops right up. You point it out your data set, seconds later, well, minutes later maybe, you get answers back. And we have a, a modern GUI, it's come to the browser, um, um, you know, it's, it's big stock ticker data exploration from the browser. So a billion transactions have a really great exploration tool, not just pick a transaction by transaction of a billion, but all kinds of filtering and sorting on them so you can look at the right set of things. And this is coming from people who had been literally using cut and paste from IBM 360 green screen emulators to Excel spreadsheets as primary workflow. So it's like, oh my freaking God, you guys, where the hell have you been? So compliance officers, I have people literally in tears. Compliance officers are like, oh my God, I can't believe this. I just, oh, this is their entire life has been turned upside down. CFTC, other regulators, totally excited. They're like, wow, this is really amazing. Just a few minutes from start to like looking at the fraud. So it's not just I walk in the door, I, I have to be in your data center, but from when I, I stick a flash stick on your machine to when you can look at fraud is about 10 minutes. And when I say look at fraud, I mean you're looking at fraud. Like your dude in-house is committing fraud right now and here's an instance of it and here's another and here's another and here's another. And you can go boil down a million transactions to the handful you need to see it to see it tick by tick, to see it in slow motion or fast speed movies times. There's all kinds of good explanations of here he's layering the layering, layering the market. Here he flips to the other side of the market, causes the market to bounce. Here's his reaping where he gets his money and here's he starts to layer it the other way. And it has the full explanation there. Great data provenance story as well. So there's legal proof that you can handle a federal judge. Literally, you can show what you see on that screen and hand the log file and what's on that screen to a federal judge, and it's like very obvious, you know, fraud evidence right there. And, and then we have this character, Tim Genopolis, who we like to say like to play with Genopoly money. He's an old school bank salesman, been in the business a long time. He's an expert to selling to banks and apparently selling us as well. Um, David gives him a company card with no oversight on expenses, and he goes hog wild. Unbelievable. Six months later, we're looking at World Series box office suites, $3,000 meals. How do you spend $3,000 on a meal? One meal, right? First class travel all over, trips to Mexico with his girlfriend, not his wife. Um, and just on and on and on. It's unbelievable. Burned a million and a half in six months. So it's like, wow, dude, that's amazing. <laughs> but that's your startup money. That's the whole engineering team budget for like a year and a half. Like, what the hell just happened? So 
David meant well, means well, but he was more in love with the concept of starting a startup than he was with actually doing the hard work that has to happen, right? Remember I talked earlier about the good stuff and the bad stuff? You, what you do is important and matters. And he was not doing the important stuff because he didn't want to. He didn't like to talk about the bad stuff either, so I would hear about it too late. He had some problem, he would come up with some screwball answer, and you know, a week later, a day later, I'd hear about it, and I'm like, oh my god, wait, no, 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 and too late. The horse left the barn. Errors of you know, leadership teams split between Silicon Valley versus Chicago. Had I been sitting in his desk, I'd have stopped that in a heartbeat. So ran out of money because he wasn't paying attention, so we missed payroll. I had employees who couldn't make rent because they actually needed payroll to payroll to pay their rent because they're in a startup, right? No health insurance. And a week later, like I thought I had health insurance, but it wasn't paid, so I wasn't told it wasn't paid. So I didn't know I didn't have health insurance. And a week later, my son has a grand mal epileptic seizure. Like, he's sitting next to me, he's playing his computer game, he suddenly locks, stops, freeze, I think he's just like acting, I'm looking funny at him, he starts to foam at the mouth, and he starts to tip over. And I catch him, and he's rigid as a rock. And he's like, mm, for like 30 seconds, I'm, holy fucking God, what do I do? So I'm shouting at my daughter to go call 911 and, and you know, trying to figure out where the hell to do this guy. And I set him on the ground, and suddenly he relaxes and rolls over and like, you know, drool, and he's out. And a grand mal seizure is like the most scary thing a parent will ever see that ultimately means nothing. It uh, means he can't drive but it doesn't have any long-term negative impact, so feel okay about that. Um, this was one, I'll, I'll tie this, so the disaster for me was I had no health insurance. So of course I paid top dollar for everything straight out of my pocket. And of course I've been not getting paychecks reliably, so I'm already pretty damn broke when this hit. Um, so that was part of the real suck job. Um, another piece of it was I was in a lot of stress and not paying attention. He wasn't taking his seizure meds. Mom didn't notice it either. So he went several months low on seizure meds. He had gone through a giant growth spurt. It was much heavier body weight. Um, he just didn't have the right level of Keppra in his bloodstream. So problem is now solved. Um, but it's part of the, the ups and the downs. So David then goes through some desperate scramble for cash, takes some really bad funding deals, um, and it takes a while to go to enterprise sales cycle, even if everybody loves it. It's clear we're going to win these deals. We have the internal champions who are chomping at the bit. We have regulators who are using our stuff, and everyone <coughs> desperately wants to know what the regulators know about what's going on in their shop. And we have the thing that lets you see what's happening in your trading shop. But we don't have any money to live through the no sales. The, the, the long sales cycle. People burn out, they run out of money, eventually got fire sailed off. Yeah, a decent company, but really sad because it was a good market product fit. It was the right thing to build for the right market, managed poorly by the CEO. So, suck. Okay, startups. Lots of wild rides. You know, my first sales and Azul and H2O and Norensic were all like, Wah! Right, first fire of a person, first quit of a person, um, discovering I'm working in a grow house with a you know, team of 10 engineers, um, built up eventually to a 30 person engineering team, right? Building awesome tech, whether it's custom hardware, world's fastest KV store, GLM on terabytes, actually finding real fraud, um, and being able to explain to people blow by blow, whoa, here and here and here and here, and have them go, holy shit, this is going on, right? Big data exploration in a browser, that was fun. Meeting some crazy people, some of them good, some of them, you know, Genopoly money. Um, if you can handle the adrenaline, I recommend it. I, I've enjoyed it. Um, if you want to pay your mortgage, um, you know, mm, Oracle may look good, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm very happy I've taken this journey, uh, very much fun. Um, and, and I'm ready to go again. So I'm currently in a zone where I'm kind of uh, 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 looking for the right next thing. I'm currently teaching classes for fun, expert programming for expert programmers. My average student has 10 or more years of experience or a PhD or some combination, rocketrealtime.com. And, and I'm way, way over budget, so done. So obviously we'll take classes until we get kicked out of the room. So classes, uh, questions, until we get kicked out of the room.
Silence. <laughs> I promise I don't bite too hard. I have an Azul, early, early Rev1 Azul box uh, uh, board at my house. And you know, it needs to be put in a shadow box and looks like, it's, it's, a, it's a board like this. It's got two giant sockets and rows and rows of chips and memory and stuff. It's not functional, but it looks really cool. No, no, I meant when you went to that team and you said, okay, you did, oh. you did just Did you keep one of those or did you actually mandate it? Um, I, I, I looked at what they were doing and the level of integration they had and declared it was sort of dysfunctional and we're going to build up from scratch and I'll grab some of the technologies and bring it over as, we, as it makes sense. So uh, I ditched the database, I, I ditched the, there's a data provenance issue in that world where if you do something with data that you then put in front of a compliance officer and somebody declares it not fraud, you have to be able to go to a judge and, a, and five years later and present what the compliance officer saw at that time. So it's a huge thing, so you do no database because immediately there's a data provenance issue. So these guys already have their data sorted out in, in data provenance, good way, so I'm gonna take their raw data every time only. So that was part of that piece. So ditch the database, ditch all the funny languages. Um, I knew I could do it with H2O as a big data ML platform. So I said, okay, we're just gonna read it with H2O and if there's other pieces we need. So there's a lot of data cleanup steps that are uh, differed by every different trading firm. So, so to eat that stock market data and do some analysis on it, I had to do like 100 cleanup steps total, but there were like 50 that were common and 50 different for every trading firm. And those were all like little one-liner pieces of Java code. If some bizarre condition, then flip this for that or what the hell. So, you know, it was, it was all easy enough to write in Java and I looked to see if I could pull parts out of the old tech and there wasn't really much parts I could grab. So the one thing that lived was the Python models that were built. So we took the original Python models, basically kept them intact, everything else ditched. Um, and we ended up running Jython in parallel, ultimately, to do the ML. So, the, so we would eat the data in H2O using this giant CSV reader, do 100 steps of cleanup all over in fractions of a second, sort it three different ways, depending on what flavor you're in the month, and break it up into all kinds of parts, and then hand it off to parallel Python, but we'd have like 100,000 snippets of, of transactions that we deemed interesting to stare at for the ML. And then so, Python would one core would do a state machine on 100 transactions and, and do a, 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 an ML based scoring tech on it was random forest ultimately. Um, and that, that was what you pulled out of the thing. So we kept the Python models running with Jython in parallel on a big cluster, but nothing else was kept. Yeah, in the back there. There, there, there was another hand over here too, but we'll take this guy. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so you, you said it's a lot it's very hard to sell the product, right? Which we've heard many people say before, I guess. Um, but so you've come from the side of building technology first or product first, and then basically going with a finished thing and trying to sell it. But would you would you advocate would you advocate trying to do that anyway, or would you say try to get some customers and then build it? Or what's right. your what's your right, right. stance now? So 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 you know flexibility is a thing. And if you go in front of a customer and you show him your, your cool toy, he says, wow, that's really great, you lost. So he has to say, oh my fucking God, it's gonna save my life. And if he's not saying that, he's not gonna pay, right? So, so you need to find that fit where the guy's freaking desperate for it. So it can be the case that you can start with one customer who's gonna pay you to do an X, but let you keep the tech as long as you support him. And then you can go shop it around, and, and, and pretty soon you'll see somebody else will say, oh, this is really cool, I want this. And you have the tech ready, but it's not ready for them, and you have to like sort it out. So we kind of went in cycles, where you would build something like a giant KV store that was really awesome, and you went in front of Apple, and they said, yeah, whatever, right? And you went in front of Amex, yeah, whatever. And then they said, well, how about machine learning? And like, okay. So we pivoted a few times, right? Somewhere in there we had to pivot from being a distributed systems company to being a math and distributed systems company. And that was really a mental pivot as well. Um, and that was because we showed product to people and they said, nope, not good enough. We're not gonna pay, try again, right? And so we went back and tried again. So there are some definite pivots and you kept going around, new people and some of the old people to try and get the right fit. Um, you know, if you're building something from scratch right now, I would make sure you have a customer who will pay right now for what you're building. 
to make sure you're not building just a pipe dream, right? If you build it, they will come, bullshit. That is not how it works, right? You have to build something somebody actually wants. Um, and that means you have to find somebody who's got cash to burn and a problem that's, that's burning them up. So, so it's not just a case of you'll, you make you know, something that people love, they actually have money to spend on it too, right? Um, yeah, so, so go in cycles, spiral out to find the solution. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Yeah.